Good evening and welcome. This is News First Prime Time News on TV One. For the News First team, the voice of the people, I'm Jaima Ratnayakar, along with our sign language interpreter for tonight, Brian De Cruz. Today is the 3rd of May 2021. Here are your headlines for tonight. Consignment of 15,000 doses of the Russian Sputnik V vaccine to arrive in the island tonight. 1906, a new hotline introduced for COVID-19 patients who have not been admitted to hospitals. Russian ambassador in Sri Lanka calls on the opposition leader. Will the Port City Economic Commission bill be debated in Parliament on Wednesday? BJP loses footing in three states in India. A power shift in Tamil Nadu after 10 years. Debutant Praveen Javikrama's 11 wickets guide Sri Lanka to first test victory after one and a half years. On to your top story for this half evening. Sri Lanka recorded 1,046 new COVID-19 infections thus far today. Accordingly, Sri Lanka's total tally of COVID-19 cases currently stands at 112,799. Official figures indicate that 12,848 COVID-19 infected individuals are currently under medical care. 967 individuals had recovered from the infection today. Accordingly, the total number of individuals who have recovered from the virus has risen to 98,209. Sri Lanka's COVID-19 death toll reached 696 after nine deaths were confirmed yesterday. What is the progress of the vaccination drive in Sri Lanka? The first shipment of a consignment of Sputnik V vaccines from Russia will arrive in the island later tonight. State Minister of Production, Supply and Regulation of Pharmaceuticals, Professor Chan Najaisuman has said 15,000 vaccines will arrive in the island as part of the first shipment. 15,000 vials of the Russian-produced Sputnik vaccine will arrive in the country tonight. This will be an initial shipment of a larger consignment. From next week onwards, consignments of 200,000, 400,000 and 800,000 will be shipped to the island on every last week of every month. How will the hospitalization of COVID-19 patients take place in the country? A hotline has been introduced for patients who have tested positive for COVID-19 but have not been admitted to hospital. Army Commander General Shavendra Silva, who heads the National Operations Center for the Prevention of COVID-19 Outbreak, noted that such individuals should notify the authorities through the hotline 1906. Deputy Director General of Medical Services Dr. Lal Panapitya has said that the directors of all hospitals have been notified to treat patients ferried through Suvasari ambulances even if they are detected to be COVID-19 patients. What are the areas that are under isolation? Several Gramaniladari divisions and police jurisdictions in 12 districts have been isolated since the 21st of April. The Kuliapitya and Pannala police jurisdictions have been placed under isolation in the Kurunagala district. The Dambulla, Galevela, Matale and Naula police jurisdictions in the Matale district have also been placed under isolation. 65 Gramaniladari divisions in 12 districts are under isolation at present. This includes Alviswatta in the Vattala police jurisdiction and the Ratmatya Gramaniladari division in the Hangurangketa police jurisdiction in the Nuaradia district. In addition, the Panadura South, Pinvatta, Narampitya, Pinvatta West and Bandaragama East Gramaniladari divisions in the Panudura South police jurisdiction have also been placed under isolation. The Uggala area in the Padukka police jurisdiction in the Colombo district and the Thissa Veerasingham Square Gramaniladari division in the Manmune North police jurisdiction in the Batikalo district are also under isolation at present. Operations of the Imadua interchange on the Southern Expressway have been temporarily suspended after two employees tested positive for COVID-19. Our correspondent reported that issuance of entrance tickets and obtaining tolls had not taken place at the Imadua interchange. Meanwhile, the main post offices in Slave Island 
Panadura, Kesselbata and Trincomalee, along with 22 sub-post offices, have been temporarily closed off at present. Deputy Postmaster General Rajit Singh has said that this was after more than 40 employees at the Department of Posts had tested positive for COVID-19. He added that postal services are not being offered in areas currently under isolation. Meanwhile, the offices of Department of Motor Traffic in Verahara and Narahinpita have temporarily suspended services for a week, starting from today. Is there an oxygen crisis in Sri Lanka? Meanwhile, Deputy Director General of Public Health Services, Dr. S.R. Arnold, clarified the current situation in the country during the Jatika Mehwara program aired on our channel earlier today. Two companies currently supply oxygen to hospitals. These companies have informed us that they can increase their capacity by two or threefold. Therefore, there is no need to agitate. There is a certain threshold. We will not be able to handle it only if it exceeds that limit. May they, uh, karana, um, 2,350 nurses have been recruited recently to service. However, not a single nurse has been provided even the first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine by the health ministry. They are setting up hospitals at their own will. However, they are not being constructed under a proper method to ensure their safety. We are witnessing that there is a heavy suspicion on the data released by various factions in the government. We see that accurate information is not being put forward regarding the number of infections and deaths. The government is controlling the rate of PCR tests to fluctuate the numbers and are conducting them at selected areas. This is a political tactic. They know to reduce the numbers of PCR tests to restore the situation to normalcy and bring down tourists. At the same time, they also know to increase PCR tests and portray a low number of infections. They couldn't administer the vaccines that were received free of charge, based on an internationally accepted mechanism. They eased all restrictions in the country to benefit the business community. Ultimately, this led to the spread of the COVID-19 virus. The effectiveness of the government's administration is similar to the Dhammika tonic. On the 8th of April, researchers at the Shri Jayawardenapura University detected that the new variant of the COVID-19 virus has re-entered the country. They informed that to the health ministry and the government, including the presidential task force. However, what were the decisions made by the government to stem the spread of this new variant? When health authorities requested to impose restrictions, it was not done properly. The state minister of health lamented before the media that the proposals put forward by the health sector were defeated. In making decisions, the government has always closed the stable doors after the horse had bolted. <laughs> We cautioned about this in advance. We requested to provide training for all nurses before the New Year celebrations. Now under these circumstances, they are unable to conduct the six-month-long training program. Many workers who still have the ability and training are made to stay at home after retirement. Without getting this labour, they gave out transfer letters and postponed it saying that there is not enough workforce to run the intensive care unit. Now they are trying to take over the nursing schools to provide accommodation. When they do that, how can they conduct training for the nurses? None of these are far-sighted decisions. The health ministry is following a short-sighted process in making these decisions. At least now, we urge the health minister to make sustainable decisions. We only have 38,000 nurses in the healthcare sector and we only have 761 intensive care unit beds within the country. We are running with minimum staff. Under these circumstances, one nurse has to work thrice as the normal shift. This is unfair. We had been pressing this issue as a union for a long period, but we didn't get any positive response for our pleas. And by now, this has reached to the point of implosion.
Diverse views are being expressed on the decision to place Piliandala under isolation. The decision announced last morning to place the Piliandala police jurisdiction under isolation was reversed last evening. Accordingly, only 10 Gramanildari divisions in the Piliandala police jurisdiction are currently under isolation as of this morning. The Gorakapitiya, Nampamunua, Dompe, Batakattara North, Palanvatta West, Kaspava South, Paranvatta East, Makandana East, Mavitara North, Madapata and Aravula North areas are currently under isolation. I made a written request from the Director General of Health Services to place the entire Piliandala area under lockdown. They had lifted the restrictions on certain areas without my knowledge. Even at present, I feel that placing the entire area under lockdown is the only way to achieve our objective. After travel restrictions were imposed in the Piliandala police jurisdiction, the Piliandala Medical Officer of Health, the Divisional Secretary and the Police Officer in Charge had convened a meeting at the residence of Minister Gamini Lokuge, who is from Kasbava, the following morning. We have learned of these details. As far as we know, this decision had been made following that discussion. <laughs> When contacts of COVID-19 infected individuals are at the residence of the minister, medical officers are being pressurized to make a decision that can impact the country. The main factor that influences the reversal of the announcement is to benefit them and their henchmen. The ministers are also concerned of their businesses and their benefits. They change the decision by pressurizing health officials only after taking this factor into account. The reports of intelligence units indicated that the entire area should not be placed under lockdown. Therefore, we requested to ease the restrictions if there is a possibility of doing so. The restrictions hamper trading with traders at the Piliandala market. Lockdowns in several areas have posed a problem on this front. The Piliandala area has not seen a spike in patients. Therefore, when we requested intelligence units to study the situation, health officials held a discussion and decided to ease the restrictions in certain areas. I have the right to stand for the well-being of the people as a parliamentarian from the area. I only exercised my right. I did not exert any form of influence. Russian ambassador to Sri Lanka, Yuri B. Materi, met with opposition leader Sajid Premadasa at the opposition leader's office today. During the meeting, the opposition leader had requested the ambassador to assist in supplying medical supplies to Sri Lanka in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. The opposition leader's office noted that the Russian ambassador had paid his attention towards these requests. In grim news from neighbouring India, India reported more than 300,000 new coronavirus cases earlier today for a 12th straight day to take its overall caseload to just shy of 20 million, as scientists predicted a peak in infections in the coming days. Hospitals in Delhi continue to send desperate messages for emergency oxygen supplies through the night on Sunday, warning that patients are at risk. The crisis started two weeks ago, but shows no signs of abating. In more news from here at home, the Director General of the President's Media Division and the President's Spokesperson assumed duties earlier today. Senior journalist Sudeva Hetiarachi assumed duties as the Director General of the President's Media Division. Meanwhile, senior journalist Kingsley Ratnayaka assumed office as the President's spokesman. The duo assumed office at the President's Media Division in Colombo Fort after engaging in religious observances. The Mahasangha bestowed their blessings upon the newly appointed officials. While attention is being drawn towards the COVID-19 pandemic, matters concerning the Colombo Port City will reach a decisive point this week as the debate on the Colombo Port City Economic Commission Bill will take place in Parliament over the coming days. Factions opposing the Colombo Port City Economic Commission Bill have cited it as a threat to the country's sovereignty. This is in light of Section 71 of the bill. A commission will be entrusted with the powers to impose regulations concerning the port city. When the bill was taken up in court, critics argued that the bill infringes the supreme authority of the parliament. 
They also pointed out that the fund that would be established by the Commission will challenge the existing consolidated fund in the country. The argument put forward by lawyers was that the bill violates the country's sovereignty over financial matters, allowing the Commission to accept foreign loans and capital into its fund and paving the way for foreigners to be appointed to the Commission are two matters that are of concern to the country's sovereignty. Banks in Sri Lanka are controlled entirely under the Finance Act by the Monetary Board or the Central Bank. However, the bill allows offshore banks and financial institutions to be established at the Colombo port city. Accordingly, arguments were put forward in court stating that this paves the way for money laundering as it surpasses the Finance Act and exchange control laws. The Colombo port city economic commission bill also proposes to exempt the application of 14 acts that are currently enforced in the country. This allows the provision of privileges and benefits. In addition, the bill notes that seven enactments shall have no application within the Colombo port city. At present, foreign direct investment that can result in benefits to the country are brought in under the provisions of the Strategic Development Projects Act and the Board of Investment Act. However, the bill proposes to exempt both these acts from the Colombo port city as well. Further, the Municipal Council's ordinance will also not be applicable to this area of authority. This bill, which contains several serious provisions, is to be taken up for a debate in Parliament on Wednesday. The Supreme Court had not informed the Parliament of its determination on the bill even by this afternoon. Against such a backdrop, various views were expressed in the political forum on the bill today. I feel that they are trying to establish the port city as a separate state. I feel that that one-day debate is insufficient. This must be debated for several days. That is because this is causing problems to the country. Why are they trying to pass this in a hurry? I feel that a two-thirds majority in parliament as well as a public referendum is required to pass the bill. The people did not give their consent to establish a Chinese colony. 6.9 million people did not vote for this. This will pose a massive threat to security in future. I must make that very clear. We will not be able to escape the Chinese. This will become a center for money laundering. I feel that this act has been drafted based on the whims and fancies of certain individuals. <laughs> The Colombo Port City Economic Commission bill that the government is trying to bring in a hurry will allow the implementation of two laws in the country. This bill contains the laws and regulations that would pave the way for a Chinese province in Sri Lanka. This is a matter affecting the country's sovereignty and independence. This bill will allow the area to become a money laundering hub in the world. The government is attempting to pass the bill following a one-day debate amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. When parliament is being convened in a hurry to pass this bill in a single day, won't the COVID-19 regulations apply in such an instance? We know that China has offered bribes to several individuals, from Buddhist monks to activists, to gain control of this land. They are remaining silent after obtaining these bribes. Therefore, the bill must be revoked immediately. <laughs> They are trying to pass this after a debate for a few hours. This is not a democratic practice. It ridicules parliamentary affairs. They are trying to silence the growing objection against the bill under the guise of the COVID-19 pandemic. We vehemently oppose such moves that are being undertaken. Instead of attempting to defeat the pandemic with the support of the people, public representatives and religious leaders. <laughs> They are convening parliament amidst the COVID-19 pandemic to pass the Port City Bill. That is their objective. They are trying to pass the bill that will affect the country's sovereignty when the people are facing several difficulties. According to Section 120 of the Constitution, the Supreme Court will be able to interpret the Constitution after a bill is gazetted and after seven days of being included in the Parliament's order paper. Therefore, the judiciary will have to interpret the bill that has been tabled and not the amendments that they have made afterwards at their own will. From a legal viewpoint, we can now observe 
that the Supreme Court has been incorporated into the legislative process. This happened in the case of the 20th Amendment as well. The judiciary cannot take part in legislative functions, another concept of separation of powers in the country. But this is continuing to take place. The second issue is that this is considered to be an extension of Colombo. But is that what Section 40 states? Prabhakaran was a warlord. He was in control of the north and the eastern regions. What we are witnessing now is an economic lord and not a warlord. The question is, if the rights of a person are violated in that area, can a case be filed at the appeal court against that? That remains unclear. This legislation does not indicate the entity that has residual powers. They are trying to allow money laundering in Sri Lanka. <laughs> Jurisdiction के दिन आधे के लिए पास है। अभी आज ना अधिकार ने इधर ही है। आधु पैवरी में बाले तीन आधे के लिए क्लियर ने। काट अदर रेसिडुअल पास तीन ने के लिए पहले लिया लने। मेकरान ने मुंबई या पादनाम करेगा तो खालू साल ली लांका वाटा तुल करन। Staying on the same topic, Speaker Mahinda Yapa Bevadana has said that the Parliament has not received the Supreme Court's determination on the Colombo Port City Economic Commission Bill. He said that the Supreme Court's determination is expected to be received by next week. The Speaker noted that the debate on the Colombo Port City Economic Commission Bill, which is scheduled for this Wednesday, will be delayed if the court determination is not received on time. Taking a look at more local news, State Minister Dilum Amnugama was sworn in as the State Minister of Community Police Affairs earlier today. Dilu Mamunugama swore in as a State Minister of Community Police Affairs this morning in the presence of President Kotabe Rajapaksa at the Presidential Secretariat. He also bears a portfolio of State Minister of Vehicle Regulation, Bus Transport Services and Train Compartments and Motor Car Industry. <laughs> Maybe it suits the person. The police and the army serve a similar purpose. We did not elect President Gotabe to act as a Hitler. We wanted him to end the reign of a dictator and to act as a peaceful public representative. If someone says he should act as Hitler and if that person is being handed positions for such a claim, there is nothing to say. The Boo Weaver stemming from the Parakrama Samudraya is a magnificent irrigation work in the country which is on the brink of destruction. Against such a backdrop, officials have failed to prevent such destruction from taking place at the Boo Weaver. The Parakrama Samudra that goes beyond the basic concept of irrigation tanks consists of six vavas. This includes the Topa vava, Erebudu vava, Dumutulu vava, Kalhagala vava, Bu vava and the Bandi vava. All these vavas excluding the Bandi vava comprise internal dams that allows them to be separated from each other. The Kalahagala vava and the Bu vava had been neglected during refurbishment carried out by the country's colonial rulers since 1937. This is the cistern sluice known as Bisokotua of the Bu vava that was constructed by King Parakramabahu in Polonnaruwa. Archaeologists consider this structure to be the cistern sluice of the Parakrama Reservoir as well. Pillar inscriptions can be found near the Parakrama Samudra at present. These inscriptions contain lettering in Sinhala and Sanskrit indicating that this is constructed by King Parakrama Bahu the Great. This is a pillar inscription concerning the Bisokotua of the Buwava. Therefore, it is clear that the Buwava belongs to the Parakrama Samudra as well. The land surrounding the Bisokotua, which is identified as the best of its kind based on excavations carried out in 1992, is now a forest. These ancient structures that were not destroyed by foreign invaders is now facing destruction at the hands of Sri Lankans. This land has fallen prey to unnecessary cultivations at present. These lands are cleaned often 
They continue to carry out cultivation activities on the land. Archaeological officials have not inquired into this. Several saplings have been planted here. They have not burnt down the existing vegetation and created an environment suitable for cultivation. <laughs> Politicians, state officials and the rulers of this country must assist in the protection of these ancient structures. But nothing has taken place in our area. Everything has gone to ruin. They are being destroyed by treasure hunters and chena farmers. Locals are urging authorities to protect ancient structures such as the Bisokotua while undertaking the refurbishment of the Buwewa. The wife of parliamentarian Rishad Badiuddin has written to the president seeking the release of her husband and his brother who were arrested recently. In a letter to President Gotabe Rajapaksa, the wife of parliamentarian Rishad Badiuddin had said that her family has been undergoing grave agony due to the unlawful and unjustified arrest of her husband. The letter read that Badiuddin is alleged to have been privy to calls between an additional secretary at the Industries Ministry, then headed by Badiuddin, and the 2019 April 21st attacks bomber in Shaf Ahmed. However, Ayesha Rishad, the wife of the parliamentarian, said that Colossus Private Limited, owned by Inshraf Ahmed, had received a license to export scrap metal only based on a meeting at the presidential secretariat. She said, and I quote, Nobody had any suspicion that the owner of the Colossus, Inshad Ahmed, would turn out to be a suicide bomber. End quote. The letter insisted that it is unfair to arrest Rishad Badiuddin under the Prevention of Terrorism Act as he had cooperated with all prior investigations on the matter. It added that the parliamentarian's brother, Riyaj Badiuddin, had also been arrested without any cause despite being acquitted by the Fort Magistrate recently. The Pathfinder Foundation organized a webinar to coincide with today's World Press Freedom Day. The Pathfinder Foundation had organized a webinar together with the Sri Lanka Press Institute under the title Right to Information, Gains of the Present and Priorities for the Future. The webinar included presentations by Sri Lanka's Right to Information Commission and India's Central Information Commission. The pandemic has actually brought out how important it is that information is readily available to the common man, to the citizens. And... Um, I think the, the theme for today, information as a public good uh, for the World Freedom Day, Press Freedom Day, is also very appropriate. Because while we are in this pandemic, the tendency is, and sometimes it's unavoidable, that work comes to a halt. And the work comes to a halt simply because the, the infrastructure or the people involved, after all, there are humans involved uh, in any of these uh, these exercises are unable to cope. How the people see the RTI as a mechanism to gain information, to gain insights, which would help them in the, the fulfillment of their objectives. In fact, in many cases, uh, people see it as a grievance redressal mechanism, which it isn't. And But it turns out that in many cases, uh, it actually turns, it, it, it serves as a grieve unintended a grievance redressal mechanism. In conceptualizing RTI, actually reimagining re RTI for Sri Lanka, our basic tool and our basic objective was to look at RTIs empowering the citizen. That was the primary purpose of right to information, which we argued, advocated, and struggled for Sri Lanka for 14 years. In the in Sri Lankan law, the commission has huge powers. The commission has the power of uh, prosecution, prosecuting public officers when they don't obey the commission's directives, and that's a very powerful threat, really, to hold out to uh, ensure compliance by public authorities. It has the power to determine which cases this information ought to be released on the public or public interest override. Unlike in India and Bangladesh and Pakistan, Sri Lanka does not have agencies exempt from the RTI law. We only have the national security exemption operating across as a general exemption, but we don't exempt entities from the reach of the RTI law. Um, and in all cases, including in national security, the public interest can operate over and above to release the information. And with that, it's a wrap of primetime news on TV1. For the News First team, the voice of the people, I'm Jama Ratnaika, along with our sign language interpreter for tonight, Bindi Cruz. Take care, stay safe, and good night.